Second lecture on high performance programming. Um, computing. Um, so, um, here is what I want to tell you about um, today. So, I'll start with a, a rather short section on uh, how to design uh, a parallel program, um, what methodology you can apply to decide where you want to introduce some uh, parallelism in your application. And then uh, I'll move on to the second part dedicated to uh, uh, MPI, uh, which is a library targeting uh, parallel programming on clusters. Okay. So uh, let's start with the design of, par of, of um, parallel programs. Um, so. Before starting to write a parallel program, you have to um, ask yourself what's your real goal, uh, what architectures you target, and uh, how much development you're ready to, um, uh, to pay for it. Uh, so obviously, um, if you want something, if you want your application to uh, remain quite simple, uh, and not too much specialized, then of course you can introduce some, some uh, parallelism inside with quite simple uh, tools as the pragmas we saw this morning, but you cannot expect to, um, uh, to um, really get uh, impressive results. Uh, even though in principle you could apply uh, the techniques we saw this morning to um, multi-core architectures with as much as a hundred cores, I don't think that many people do it. Usually when you have uh, so many cores, you tend to um, uh, group them together and consider them as they are, uh, sharing some memory. And then uh, between these groups, you tend to use what I will talk about in the second part, and act as if they were actually on, um, on uh, different nodes. Okay. Uh, and of course, the, the one of the, the, uh, the most important points uh, when you, you, you're about to uh, implement parallel application is to know uh, on which architectures you want to execute it, and uh, I mean, what are the, the, the programming constraints you're facing, uh, what technology uh, people working with you know. Uh, I mean, one of the main issues with, uh, with parallel programming is the maintenance of the code. Ob obviously, as soon as you try to introduce some parallelism inside, things become more complex and then uh, more difficult to uh, to maintain. Uh, so, the first question to ask to decide where to introduce the parallelism is um, to um, try to carry out a dependency analysis on your code. What you want to do is uh, have a graph of the different tasks involved in your application and how they depend on each other. Uh, so uh, the thing you want to do is first group the data uh, and try to see uh, which, well, how the data are produced. Either they all exist at the beginning or some of the data are actually uh, byproducts of uh, side computations. So uh, you need this um, uh, analysis over time. Uh, and this is related with the scheduling of your, uh, of your application. So I'll, I'll come back to this um, in, uh, in a few slides. So this is typically um, 
the um, the way you you could introduce uh, well try to analyze in which part you can introduce parallelism. So you start with a sequential problem, you split it in uh, many tasks. Possibly the smallest possible, and uh, I'll come back to this uh, in the slide just after. And then you group these tasks, these tasks together uh, and assign them to uh, a certain number of processes. Uh, and then inside your parallel program, uh, you um, implement the communications between uh, all these um, all these processes, and then the question is how to efficiently uh, map the different processes to um, the hardware. Uh, okay, so uh, to go a little more into details uh, into the, this um, this question, so. First, you want to identify the elements um, that will allow you to introduce uh, parallel processing inside and determine the, uh, the right granularity of, uh, of your decomposition. Um, so usually what you do is um, you break up your computations into um, small tasks and then once you have your, let's say, your inventory tasks, you, ta you, you, you try to um, gather them in uh, larger tasks as long as they remain independent. And when you have the feeling that, well, um, you've reached a level at which you're about to break the independence, then it probably means that this is the granularity where you want to introduce parallelism in your code. Okay. Uh, and of course, in many applications, actually, um, the number of tasks you will have to uh, carry out depends on time. Uh, so uh, then you need, um, you, you can't use a, a, a static approach to, um, to, adjust, to adjust the load balancing of your program. You need something uh, more dynamic. Uh, and in such a situation, obviously, you want to make sure that uh, you don't have more tasks than uh, the number of uh, processes available at a given time, because otherwise you won't be able to execute them in, uh, in, uh, in parallel, okay? Uh, and so this, this question of um, balancing uh, the work you have to do at a given time is related to uh, one exercise we'll do in the uh, end-on session of, uh, of tomorrow related to the master-slave paradigm. Uh, okay. So, when you want to introduce parallelism in uh, in an application, you can either uh, look at your application from the data point of view or from the computational point of view, uh, which is almost the same duality as um, using uh, functional languages or uh, object-oriented languages. Either you rather focus on the, um, the functionalities you need or uh, on the data you're going to manipulate. So, uh, well, I think this is uh, a question of taste, actually. Uh, in many uh, evolved applications, you actually tend to use a combination of uh, these two approaches. One is, one may be uh, more appropriate than, uh, than the other. Uh, okay, so once you've split your uh, application in smaller tasks and uh, know that you can uh, execute them in, in parallel. Uh, the next question is uh, how to efficiently um, make them communicate. And then you have to describe the data flow you need in your application 
which tasks are going to uh, produce which data. And so this gives you um, a sequential guideline for your, uh, for your application. You know that if uh, task B needs the data produced by task A, then these two can't execute concurrently. Okay. Um, and uh, one very important message about um, communication is that you should definitely avoid using many small communications. Each time you initiate a communication, there's uh, an overhead. So you definitely want to group communications together and send a large message rather than several small messages. Okay. And uh, at the very end of the presentation, I'll come back to this point to explain you what strategies you can use to try to group uh, heterogeneous um, data together uh, in uh, a single large message. Uh, okay, so, well, this is uh, almost what I was saying. Uh, reduce the communication cost by increasing uh, the, um, the size of the data you, um, you send in your communications. Um, and, uh, well, and you also need to um, really focus on how you balance communication and uh, computations. You, you need to make sure that uh, you don't have a process waiting for data that aren't available at the time. Because, well, if if you use blocking communications, as I will describe in a few slides, uh, then if the data is not available, the process is just waiting till it can, it can receive the data. So you really have to um, make sure that, well, if the data are not available yet, maybe I can compute something else in between and it will be helpful for the, um, uh, for the future. Okay. Uh, well, and the very last question when you have uh, designed all the, uh, the, the small tasks and how you will make them communicate together is how do you map your different tasks to, um, to the hardware? Uh, well, and uh, so obviously, well, there are at least um, two guidelines for this. Um, if you have... Um, Tasks that will um, execute concurrently but do not communicate, then they can be placed in um, different processing units that may be quite far away from um, a memory access point of view. On the contrary, if you have uh, tasks that will communicate quite often, then you need to make sure that they are uh, located nearby in the um, in the hardware, just to make sure that well the data remain close to the processing units, so that hopefully they can be cached and the execution is much faster. Okay. Uh, uh, well, this is. Um, summed up here. So you have two ways of, um, of doing this. Either you have a quite simple problem. Let's say, for example, you have uh, a Monte Carlo type application. So everything is quite regular. You know in advance how many simulations you're going to do. Each simulation takes approximately the same time. Uh, and then you can use some static mapping. You know that, well, these, proce these uh, processing units will always do the same kind of task. They won't communicate, so you, you just put them on the, uh, on the processing units in a given way, and that's fine. Uh, but then you may have a situation in which uh, the number of tasks uh, evolves over time, and um, uh, all the tasks require different computational times, and in this case, you need a dynamic load balancing. You need really to uh, 
rebalance uh, how you distribute your computations over time just to make sure that uh, you don't have uh, uh, one processing unit that is completely overworked compared to, uh, to the others. Keep in mind that um, the computational time of uh, a parallel program is the computational time of uh, the slowest uh, processing unit involved in it. Okay, so if you're, you didn't manage to quite well to, to balance uh, the different processing units, uh, then uh, you will probably uh, waste quite some uh, considerable time in it. Okay. Uh, so uh, if, if your program falls in one of these two um, cases, then you probably want to use um, some kind of um, master-slave approach. So you have um, someone, well, you have, you identify one processing unit which we usually call the master. And its only um, role in the application is just to uh, send work to the others. Okay, so um, usually you just sacrifice one of your uh, core that won't do any calculation during the, um, the program, but it will, it will just uh, be listening uh, which processing unit has finished is uh, the work that has been assigned to him. And as soon as it is finished, uh, it sends him something new to do. Okay? Uh, and we'll try to uh, implement it uh, tomorrow. Uh, well, of course I said you sacrifice one core. Imagine you have a million cores you immediately realize that one core to manage all the others won't be enough. So this master-slave approach um, tends to face a bottleneck if you have too many cores. So in this case, what you usually do is you do a two the same approach but on a two-level uh, mechanism. So you, you have uh, the great master with uh, talking to only second level masters and who will in the end distribute the work. Okay. Uh, okay, so after this uh, short introduction, I move to um, the uh, MPI library. So MPI stands for uh, Message Passing Interface. So this is the typical uh, architecture targeted by, uh, by MPI. You have uh, several CPUs, each with its own memory, and uh, well, they are all plugged on uh, an interconnecting network. Okay, and of course, there's no way to go from this memory to this one without uh, going through the network. Okay. This is the typical case of, uh, of a cluster. Uh, so, OpenMP was targeting uh, shared memory architectures as, the, as we did uh, this morning, uh, but the number of processing units you can really um, use with uh, a reasonable efficiency is limited. So to, uh, to go on a larger scale, uh, you need something else, and uh, the solution we uh, present today is this one. Okay. Uh, so MPI is actually uh, a communication library. The, 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 the real feature it provides is a way to um, uh, make processes located on different computers communicate together through the network without actually uh, using um, any communication protocols by yourself, which is quite um, tedious, actually. Uh, so, um, the different processes can communicate together and, uh, and 
MPI as uh, the ability to handle heterogeneous systems. So um, inside of all the, uh, the computers you consider, or let's say the, the, the cluster, uh, you can actually have different systems. And as soon as they all have their own uh, open MP, well, MPI library, if it's the same version, then everything should be fine. They should be able to uh, communicate together. You can, for instance, mix 64-bit uh, and 32-bit machines in the same uh, cluster. It shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Uh, well, the real difficulty that uh, comes with uh, programming uh, shared memory architectures is that you really, the developer really needs to um, and all the communications by himself when writing the code. So if you, if you know that uh, the process zero, well, process one will need some data produced by the process zero, then you have to make sure that somehow, somewhere you have an instruction saying, send this data from process zero to process one. Okay. Uh, and then of course, process one should be um, uh, able to receive some data. So we'll see that when you want to make two processes communicate, then uh, the two are involved in the communication. It, well, both need to um, say, well, I'm, I'm willing to do something about communication. One sends and the other receives. So it's, uh, it's really um, uh, working as a pair. Uh, so, Basically, what you have is you have a single program which uh, executes several processes simultaneously. And uh, some processes may run locally and uh, some and the others uh, on the, 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 the different processes units, uh, processing units you have uh, at disposal. Okay. So you write from a practical point of view, okay, you write a single code, let's say a C file, and uh, you compile it, it creates an executable, and this executable is run on the number of processing units you specify at the beginning. So it's the same executable that you run everywhere. It's your job inside this code to say, well, if the executable has index zero, then do this. If it has index one, then do this. If you want to specialize the task that will be uh, executed by the different um, processes. As the program is actually made of uh, independent executables, uh, independent processes, each has its own data which is uh, completely the opposite of uh, what we saw this morning. Uh, and the data are stored locally, and the only way to get access to some data stored on another um, processing unit is to go through the network. Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, here is a typical example. You, you, you have uh, some data a here, and this CPU wants to, uh, to access it. So the only way is that this guy sends, well, issues uh, a communication from here to there, saying, well, I'm willing to send some data stored in my local memory to you. Do you want to receive it? And if this one doesn't say, well, okay, I want to receive something, this one is blocked. Okay. Usually communications are blocking. Well, uh, at the very, very end, I'll explain to you that you can use um, non-blocking communications, but it's more difficult to, uh, to implement and it should be done with care. And if it ever happens that you have, uh, that you use non-blocking communications in your code, and uh, obviously the results you get is not the one you expect, uh, then you probably have a real bad time uh, 
debugging it. Uh, so MPI appeared for the first time in uh, 1993, so it's something quite uh, old and uh, standardized today. It's considered as portable, efficient, flexible. This is really, um, well, I think that this is the one library that's using for um, uh, designing progr uh, parallel program on cluster architectures. Um, so it can be used uh, in C, C++, there's also a Fortran um, interface in the, um, in the library. And it may be available as uh, packages in other um, languages or scripting languages. For instance, uh, you can use MPI in Python. There's a dedicated package uh, which is just a wrapper around this um, this library that enables you to access the the MPI functions uh, using Python code. The same holds for R or and probably MATLAB and so on. So uh, this is actually quite simple to um, uh, to write um, a wrapper to uh, to MPI. Um, Um. <laughs> okay, well, um. so the focus of the, the library is really to um, to data. Um, the um, the only facility it gives you is. Uh, to uh, allow you to transfer data from uh, one uh, process to, uh, uh, to another. So one thing important is here, the, at the very, um, these two things at the very uh, end. Uh, and it allows me to introduce an important notion for MPI, which is the notion of uh, communicator. I will come back to, uh, to this uh, later, but at this point, what I want to say is that processes are grouped together into something called a communicator. And if you want two processes to uh, be able to communicate together, then they should be part of a common communicator. Okay. Uh, and I've already said a few times uh, since the beginning, um, I was talking about the, um, the number of a process, so it's index. So the, in MPI, this is called a rank uh, here. And actually, the rank is something um, relative to uh, a communicator. So if a given process is part of two communicators, it may have uh, different ranks depending uh, on the communicator you're considering. Uh, okay. Uh, so, um, well, this is what you uh, may find in, uh, in MPI. So, uh, what I would like to talk a bit about today is uh, well, what's the, uh, the environment you have, and I'll give you a few guidelines of, how to compile and execute your code. Uh, and then uh, I'll move on to um, communications. I will first uh, present you a few point-to-point -point communications. So these are communications only involving two processes. Uh, and then uh, I'll say a few words about global communications. Uh, they can be of very, various uh, natures. Um, and uh, I'll the, at the end, uh, I'll explain you what strategies you could use when you want to manipulate uh, complex data. By complex, I mean uh, heterogeneous. Um, let's say you have um, 
a C structure and you want to send it, uh, how can you do it? Okay. Uh, so from a very practical point of view, here is how to compile your uh, MPI code and run it. So all the functions are located in this uh, header file. And then, uh, as for every library, when you want to compile it, you have to tell the compiler where the uh, header files are located and where the library is, uh, is located. And for um, conveniency, um, MPI actually uh, provides uh, wrappers around GCC. So instead of trying to find out uh, where the library is actually installed on your system, if you simply compile your code using MPI CC or MPI C++, will just be fine. The, uh, the different flags are automatically added. Okay. Uh, and then, so now that you know how to compile your code, um, when you come to um, execute your code, you, you have to do something special because obviously you don't want the, exec the different uh, executables to be completely independent because you want to make sure that they'll be able to communicate. And this is achieved by uh, running your executable in this way. So um, to run your executable, you use uh, MPI run which is uh, an executable provided by the uh, MPI library. And then uh, you tell him at the end, okay, I want to execute this uh, executable that I've just compiled. And just before you have two options, uh, this uh, machine file option uh, gives the file containing the list of uh, machines you have on which uh, you may execute, um, on, on which you may place um, processes. And this minus uh, NP flag tells you uh, how many copies of your executable you want to uh, execute at the same time. Okay. So, uh, and the, the, um, the file you preview uh, just pass here, uh, should have this format. So uh, in each line you have um, the name of, um, of a machine and then you can after add some uh, optional arguments uh, which are related to the number of executables you're ready to uh, uh, run on this given node. Uh, okay, so um, Yeah, so slots here is usually the, uh, the number of cores available on, uh, on, the, not, on the node given here. And uh, well, it may happen that you don't exactly, that you don't want to run on a given node as many processes as the number of available cores. For instance, because you know that otherwise you'll be facing memory bottlenecks. So usually this uh, y variable is smaller than x. Okay. Uh, okay. So here is for the uh, the practical uh, information on uh, on using uh, MPI. Uh, so the first thing you do when you uh, want to use MPI in a code is to create the MPI environment for the code. So uh, this is achieved by calling the, the uh, MPI init function, this one, uh, which uh, actually creates uh, a global communicator involving all the processes uh, that have been uh, launched. Okay, so this is the, the, uh, the global and default communicator called uh, MPI com world, and this will be the only communicator we'll use during um, the hands on session. Okay. So this communicator uh, contains all the processes that are executed by MPI run. Okay. Is this clear? So this 
this is something to the, this function MPI in it is to be called at the very beginning. Uh, and similarly, at the very end of your program, just to make sure everything uh, finishes properly, you just have to call MPI finalize. Okay. Uh, and then in the middle, you can do everything you want. There are two important fun functions uh, in, uh, in MPI related to uh, uh, the index of a given uh, process. Uh, you have this function, MPI com size, uh, which gives you the number of uh, processes that have been uh, launched by MPI run. This is the equivalent of uh, the, the function giving you the number of threads in OpenMP. And you have uh, the, the, uh, the function MPI com rank, uh, which gives you uh, the rank or the index of uh, a given process. Okay. And obviously, these two, uh, these two values are relative to the communicator you pass as the first argument. Uh, well, and all the um, the MPI, all, all MPI programs you may write will contain calls to these four functions. Okay. So here is a typical example. Uh, so at the beginning, you include your MPI, uh, your edit file, and then uh, the first thing you do is call MPI init at. Uh, at the very beginning of your code. Well, you may declare variables above. Uh, and then once you've called this initialization function, uh, you can request the size and the rank of a given uh, process. Uh, and then at the end, you call uh, finalize. And usually the only instruction following finalize is a call to return or exit. Okay. Uh, Okay, so um, let's describe a bit the basics, the basic communications in, uh, in MPI, the point-to-point -point communication. So uh, these are communications between two processes only. So you have one sending uh, information and the other one receiving. Uh, and these two operations are uh, complementary. You really need to have the two to make sure a communication is actually issued. Um, so when you want to send information, which we call a message, um, you have to specify several things. Of course, you have to specify the, the data you want to send, but you also have to specify uh, some context. And uh, among all the things you have to specify, you, you obviously find uh, the communicator, which is useful to um, correctly identify the rank of um, the sender and the receiver. And then you also have to specify something uh, denoted here, which is, uh, which we call a tag. Uh, well, a tag is something to have two uh, communications, uh, a send and a receive match, they should both have the same tag. Okay, otherwise uh, they can't be used together. Uh, uh, so, Tags may be used to identify groups of communications. Uh, you can have several communications using the same tag. It's not a problem. Uh, but uh, usually people tend to use uh, different tags to emulate uh, what you may have already encountered in um, operating in, in programming operating systems known as signals. You know, uh, when you have several processes uh, running on um, on the same uh, well processor, let's say, 
you can just uh, emit signals to give some information. For instance, on the Linux, when you're in your terminal and something goes wrong and you just hit Control C, what you're actually doing is emitting uh, a kill signal. And the signals can only be received by processes um, running on the same processor. So one way of emulating this on uh, multi-processor uh, multi architectures is to use empty messages with different tags. For instance, when you use this uh, master save approach I was talking about uh, a few minutes ago, when you have um, one processor, let's say uh, the master, sending uh, work to, um, to the others, obviously you need a way at the end to uh, tell the different uh, other processes, well now it's finished. I know everything I wanted to know, you, you, you don't have anything more to do. So then you, you want to send a signal, that's, that's the end. And usually what you do to do this is just uh, send a message with a specific tag but with no uh, contained data because you don't have anything specific to send, it's just finished, you just have to say okay, bye bye, that's the end. So uh, this is... Um, one typical usage of this uh, uh, of this tag. So the two uh, basic communication functions in MPI are these two: the function to send data and the function to receive, uh, which have almost uh, the same arguments. So uh, the first argument is uh, the address of the data you want to send. Uh, and the following two actually describe the length and the type of the data. So uh, in this function you expect to find at this address an array of size count and each cell of the array has type data type. Okay. And then you say I want to send it to the process with rank dest uh, inside the communicator com and I tag it like this. And obviously for this um, send this instruction to complete, uh, then the process with rank dest should issue a call to the function MPI receive. Um, the tag here should match the one there. The communicator will probably be the same. Uh, the sources is the rank of the process uh, which called uh, MPI send. And uh, count is the number of elements that were sent along with their types. And here you just put the address where you want to write the data you're going to receive. So make sure this address is valid for writing as much as information uh, given by the length there. So it probably means that before calling MPI receive you will have to allocate um, space to store the information you're about to receive. Okay. You always have to uh, handle allocations by yourself when using MPI. Uh, well, okay, so this uh, just uh, summarizes what I've just told you. Uh, the same for uh, MPI receive. Uh, well, there's one extra argument I haven't talked about in uh, MPI receive, which is this uh, status variable. So if I go back just two slides, uh, this is actually, um, uh, well, it has type MPI status. Uh, which is a structure, uh, an internal structure of MPI carrying information about um, the, uh, the received message. Um, and, okay, it's not written. Uh, so in particular, in this variable, um, you may find what was the actual tag used when sending um, the message. Uh, 
uh, which process did actually send the message uh, and uh, a few other informations. Well, I mentioned these two because it may happen that uh, you're just waiting for someone to send you something, but you don't exactly know who. And in this case, you can't call receive when with uh, you can't call receive with a particular number for source because you don't know which process is going to, is going to send you something. So there's, there are special values for uh, source and tag. You can actually say, well, I don't know who's going to um, talk to me, so I just say, uh, I'm ready to receive something for any source. And you write here, MPI any source. Uh, and I don't actually know the tag, which is what may happen when you have a master-slave approach and um, you're a slave, you just, uh, you've just uh, sent your, uh, the answer of the last computations you were assigned, and now you're waiting for uh, the master to tell you something, but you don't know if, if it will tell you to continue working or to stop or send you new uh, data. And this information is usually um, contained in the, in the tag, so you want to be able to um, receive a message, uh, whatever the tag, whatever tag he has. Yes. So in this case, you can use um, the value MPI any tag instead of uh, a given value for tag. So if you use uh, any for this value or this one, then you want to be able to actually uh, know what was the real value used for these arguments by the sender of the message. And this information can be found in uh, this variable. Okay, uh, okay so here is a, a typical example of uh, a basic communication. So uh, you have your uh, initialization function um, you retrieve the size, the rank of your uh, process, and then you say, well, if, uh, if I'm process zero, which is usually considered as being the master, um, then um, I just uh, say hello to everyone. Uh, so I write uh, hello with the index of uh, the given process in, uh, in a string and send it. Okay, so I, s I send a, a message of length, well, the length of the string and uh, the, um, the cell of a string is just uh, a character and this corresponds to uh, MPI character. Uh, sorry, here. And then I, I send this message to pro the process with uh, rank i, and my tag here is 99. Okay. Uh, so this is what happens if I am process 0, and then uh, if my index is something else than 0, well, I expect process 0 to uh, say me hello. So I'm just... Um, uh, waiting for a process zero to send me a message with, uh, with a given length. Uh, and I expect the, the, the message to come from process zero. The tag is the right one, uh, and, so, uh, and so on. And then uh, I just print that I've received um, a message, and I call finalize. Okay. Um, well, I think I've more or less already uh, said that, so uh, uh, so um, to be re so um, when you have a send and a receive message, the tags should match, uh, but also the types. Otherwise, um, it, it won't be uh, received um, uh, properly. Uh, 
So these uh, communication functions are blocking communications, which means that uh, when one process calls the send function, the execution of this process is blocked until um, until it can manipulate the data involved in the sending without um, well until it can actually destroy the data used in the sending let's put it this way okay uh, and uh, and on the other end the the process who's going to uh, uh, issue the, rec the, the receive function is also blocked until some data are available for receiving. Okay. Uh, I'll give you some more specific uh, information dep depending on the, the, the version of the sending function you're using because there are actually two or uh, three versions of the sending function. Um, uh, okay, so this is more or less what's contained in this uh, in these two um, items. So here is a list of um, uh, giving you the uh, the correspondence between uh, C types and the equivalent uh, MPI types. Okay, so this is just uh, for practical uh, um, usage in uh, when you're writing code. Um, uh, okay, well, this type was about um, the, the uh, any version of sources and, uh, and tag. Uh, and also mentions uh, an interesting uh, function which combines this one, which combines the send and, uh, and receive. Imagine you have um, two processes trying to uh, exchange some data. Because communications are blocking, if you want, let's say, process zero and one to exchange some data, then you have to make sure that uh, they, do it, they don't do it in the same order, so that process zero first sends to one, uh, whereas one um, first wants to receive, and the other way around after. So if you don't want to uh, bother with this, then you just use this function, which takes care of the right order for you. Okay. Um, so obviously from a computational point of view, uh, communication is just a waste of time. So um, you want to make sure that um, you do not communicate too much and you communicate at the right time. So uh, if you use blocking communications, make sure that uh, when one process calls MPI send, there's another one, well, there's the, um, the destinator of the message that is also calling uh, MPI receive. Otherwise, the sender will just be blocked. Uh, if you do not this, if you do not um, do this carefully, well, you may just have some processes waiting for I mean the the, um, the situation to uh, just uh, uh, go on. Um, so there are several strategies to um, uh, overcome this uh, this problem. The first uh, strategy, the first one, is to try to um, uh, overlap um, computation and uh, and communication. So uh, this is the uh, the interest of uh, non-blocking communications. Uh, you can just um, if you don't know if the data are ready for, uh, um, for receiving, you can say, well, I'm ready to receive something. Tell me when, it, when I can actually um, uh, get the data. And you can continue uh, working meanwhile. Okay. Uh, 
And several communicate well, some communicating functions may tend to use uh, temporary buffers to uh, in which they copy the message to be actually sent. Uh, they have the advantage that as soon as the message is copied in the buffer, the um, the execution can uh, go on. <coughs> but then, at each time you you're ready to issue a message, you actually pay the price for a copy. And as I have already said, uh, you always want to uh, prefer few communications, but with uh, larger data sets. Uh, okay, so this is somehow a, a recap of uh, what I've already um, uh, said. Uh, yes. So these are the two, the, um, the equivalent non-blocking um, functions uh, in, uh, in MPI. So instead of, um, instead of calling uh, MPI send, you just add uh, an I here, uh, which has, and if, when you use these functions, your code is not blocked by uh, the communication uh, uh, you want to, um, to initiate. But then, of course, it sounds appealing because then you don't face these problems of uh, waste of time because you want to receive data that we, which is not available yet. But it makes uh, handling communications much more difficult. Uh, because when you, for instance, when you call uh, MPI uh, I receive, uh, you just say, well, uh, I'm ready to uh, receive some, uh, some information, but then when you actually want to get it later on, you have to make sure that the message is actually available. Uh, so um, uh, instead of just using one instruction, a receive instruction, you have to use uh, uh, many more. So it's uh, uh, it's not so easy to um, to implement. Uh, so you actually uh, have these three functions, which are very useful when you uh, use non-blocking uh, communications. Uh, you may say, well, now I want to when to wait until the data uh, are available. Uh, you want to uh, test with if um, the request has been uh, completed, so if the data have actually been uh, received. Uh, and you may also want to uh, test if uh, a message is ready to be uh, received. So there are several tests that you, you need to add in your, uh, in your code to make sure that everything goes well. Okay. Um, okay. To, um, to go back a bit to um, uh, blocking communications, which are also called asynchronous uh, communications, um, I told you about the function MPI send, but there's also a, a variant of it, this function MPI S send, uh, which, uh, which will never use uh, a temporary buffer for the communication. So depending on the implementation and the version of MPI you have, your function MPI send may or may not use temporary buffers. If you want to make sure that you won't use a buffer, then use this one. Um, okay. uh, and this function is, uh, well, blocks the execution until there's um, a receive, uh, well, until there's uh, the corresponding call to um, the receive function. Okay. When, well, the sender gets actually unlocked as soon as um, a receive starts somewhere. Well, corresponding receive starts somewhere. Uh, 
But it's not because um, the execution has gone on uh, on the um, on the sending process that the data are actually correctly received on the uh, the receiver process. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, and if you really want to use uh, buffers, then you can do their uh, dedicated functions. But I, I won't talk about them. Uh, so um, here is a recap of uh, the different functions, well, the different elementary sending and receiving functions you may uh, find. Uh, well, this is uh, more or less what I've already um, said about how to optimize uh, communications. Uh, okay, so I think I will stop right after this one. Uh, well, this has nothing to do with communications, actually, but I just wanted to tell it uh, to tell you this at some point. Uh, when you want to um, measure the computational time of uh, a parallel program, uh, there are specific functions provided by the libraries uh, you're using. So, for instance, some of you this morning tried to um, uh, measure the computational time of um, of your uh, OpenMP code. Uh, and you probably noticed that if you did it the same way as in a sequential code and you and call the function clock, what you actually get in the end is uh, the sum of the computational times of all the threads you've created. So it's probably a little larger than the sequential computational time. Because what you actually want uh, when measuring the performances of uh, a parallel program is not really the computational time, but rather the real elapsed wall time. What really matters is how long do you need to wait before getting the answer, okay? Uh, and uh, when using MPI, the way to, uh, to, to know this is to call this function uh, MPI W time W standing for wall. Okay, uh, so this gives you uh, a time in uh, an elapsed time in seconds. So as for the clock function, you just call it once at the beginning, once at the end. You compute the difference, and you have uh, the time needed for your application to run. Uh, okay. Well, um, shall we have a short break now? Okay, so um, let's start for the second half of um, this lecture. So just before the break, I talked about point-to-point -point communications. Now I'll move to um, global communications, um, uh, collective communications, actually, which uh, involves which involve all um, the the processes inside a given um, communicator. Uh, so these functions, um, <coughs> enable to uh, send or receive, depending on uh, the type of, uh, of communication uh, involved, but to send uh, or receive uh, data between several uh, processes. Uh, so I will detail a few of them in the, in the coming slides. Um, uh, so one important difference uh, between these functions and uh, the point-to-point -point communications is that in these functions, there's no tag. Okay. This uh, argument has just um, disappeared. So um, these um, collective communications um, are somehow equivalent to calling uh, several point-to-point -point, uh, communications. Of course, uh, when I say equivalent, I mean from the point of view of uh, the, the data transferred, but definitely not from the point of view of efficiency. It's much more efficient to use um, collective communications than to use uh, many point-to-point -point communications, okay? Uh, and um, the process 
that actually sends the data is uh, the one with rank uh, zero in the, uh, the involved communicator, always. Okay. So um, here is uh, a short listing of the different uh, collective communication functions uh, available. Um, and uh, I will present now um, a, few, uh, a few of them. So uh, the first case of uh, collective communication is uh, this one. So um, assume you have uh, some data here, data A, and uh, you want to send it to uh, all the processes in your uh, communicator. So one way of doing it is simply to make um, three sends. Three, three calls to the send function, or to use this function uh, broadcast, um, which um, takes as the first argument the address of, uh, well, this argument has actually, um, uh, is used twice. It doesn't have the same meaning on um, the process with rank root here, which is the one actually, which actually uh, sends the information. Uh, whereas on all the other processes, uh, this is the address where the, um, the data will be stored. Okay, so the meaning is different. Uh, as for the point-to-point -point communications, this uh, count is the number of elements uh, to be uh, sent, and data type is the type of uh, the given uh, elements. Okay, um, uh, and uh, and root is uh, is the rank of um, the um, uh, the process which is actually sending the data. Okay. <coughs> So this is the first uh, collective communication. So um, when using collective communications, each process involved in the communication has to call the collective uh, communication function. So imagine you have, uh, so you're in the simple situation, your communicator is uh, the default one, MPI com world. Uh, you have, um, let's say, 10 processes in your communicator. Each of the 10 processes should call, must call this function uh, MPI broadcast. Okay. And of course, the, uh, well, all the arguments will be the same on, uh, on all the processes, except perhaps the first one. Well, and then after you have uh, a variant of this broadcast function, when you have, uh, uh, let's say you start with uh, an array of data on the root process and you want to uh, split it in blocks and send each block to a different uh, destination, uh, then instead of using broadcast, you use uh, scatter. Uh, and well, and of course, because you, you, you want to break um, a given uh, memory area, the, not, the arguments are a little more complicated. So um, you have uh, the address of the sending of the, um, the data to, send, to be sent, the number of, da the, this, yes, the number of data to, to send, the type of them, and the same for uh, the receiving part then the rank of the process actually sending the data and the communicator. Um, these two types should match, so they should be the same. Okay. Um, if you, if the, um, so this function has to be called by all the processes involved in your communicator. Okay. If the process you are considering as uh, rank root, this, uh, well, the, um, the information concerning the receiving part is actually not used. So you may well put here uh, zero, the null, null pointer. 
uh, whereas it's the contrary on all the other processes. Uh, if you're on a process that will actually receive the data, then uh, this part is not used. Okay? Because obviously the addresses may just not be valid on some of the processes. Uh, okay. Uh, so here is the detailed explanation of, um, of what's going on. Uh, so it is equivalent to calling MPI send several times, uh, but with uh, changing the address of the data to be sent. Uh, uh, and, um, and on each uh, process that's supposed to receive something, you have to call, uh, to call receive. Uh, okay. uh, and after you have uh, the same operation, but the other way around, you have several data split on several processes and you just want to um, uh, gather all of them on a single uh, process. So you have the same type of, uh, well, the, the, you have the same arguments, uh, but it, it's the complementary operation, okay? Uh, so that's the explanation. Uh, and you may also want to imagine you, ha you, have, you are in this situation, so you have all these uh, uh, data uh, spread among the different processes uh, and you want to make sure that in the end uh, every process has uh, all, the, all the data. Uh, so instead of calling um, gather, gather for uh, well quite a number of times because you have to change this uh, the, the value for root you can actually call uh, a more global function, which is uh, this one, the all gather, which exactly performs what you expect. So you start with um, just uh, this, these data and uh, you arrive with this uh, situation in the end. Okay. Uh, so uh, yes, and then you have uh, variance of all this. Okay, well, uh, I'm not going to detail all these um, uh, global communications because there are many of them and uh, uh, well, I don't think it's really uh, interesting just to uh, listen to someone talking about all these collective communications. It's much more interesting to implement them by yourself. So uh, there are in the, in the slides just to, uh, so that you can um, uh, have a look at it by yourself and if you have questions on it, uh, we'll be happy to um, try to answer it, to answer your questions. Um, one thing I, I want to uh, talk about because this is something important in particular in the context of uh, Monte Carlo applications this is um, the communications uh, used for reductions. This is something we already saw in uh, using well, when using MPI, uh, um, when using OpenMP. We had these spe special variables which were neither private nor shared, but that is that something in between. Um, and you can achieve the same thing in uh, in open MP, in MPI when you have uh, data on uh, different processes. You may um, and what's and you are not actually interested in the end in uh, all the data all the results separately, but in just. Uh, a reduction of all these elementary results into a given operation, then you can uh, simply do it using MPI reduce instead of um, uh, gathering all this, all these uh, results and uh, making the, the, the combination um, in place on a given uh, process. So you can just call this function uh, reduce and uh, uh, so you have almost the same arguments as before. You have the data type of the arguments uh, involved. The number of arguments 
uh, involved in each uh, on each uh, process. So count is actually uh, this corresponds to the number of elements in this guy, uh, which will actually be used also the number of elements in this guy in the end. And uh, the, da the data found in the end in this is obtained through this uh, the operation described by this uh, argument. Okay, and there are a number of uh, predefined operations for uh, reduction. It's in the slide just after. Uh, but you may also define your own operations if needed. Okay. Uh, okay, so here is a list of the available uh, operations. Uh, so you can compute a maximum, a minimum, a sum, a product, uh, and also uh, and more complex things. And you can create uh, some new operators using uh, MPI op create and MPI op free just to uh, free the, um, uh, the memory required by the operator in the end. Uh, okay. uh, so this is the simple uh, reduction. You can do um, more, more sophisticated reductions. Um, uh, and this can be achieved by using these uh, these functions. Uh, so you, you have this one and uh, and also scan. So these are a bit more complicated. I just uh, I think that it's easier to just um, read the slides and have a look at the um, schemes to try to understand uh, what's going on. And you can just. Uh, do some examples. By the way, uh, you probably, if you install the library on, uh, uh, on your computer, you probably also have um, demand pages associated with all these functions. So from the terminal, you can just uh, type man with the, main, the name of uh, one of these functions and you should get the manual. So you have a description of the function, uh, the meaning of the different arguments, and very often you also have some examples. Okay, so you can actually try them and see uh, what's going on. Okay. Uh, so these are still uh, variants of, uh, of the reduc reduction and so on. Uh, okay, so that's almost all I wanted to say on uh, collective communications. Um, uh, and uh, just to finish this short introduction to MPI, I want to talk about uh, how to handle uh, complex data in, uh, in communications. Um, it may not have been that obvious to you, but in all these functions, let's take the last one for instance, you have uh, this argument, this uh, MPI data type. And this has something, this must be uh, one of the types that were given uh, uh, probably a little before, there. So if you want to manipulate anything that's, that not, does not uh, have one of these types, then you cannot directly use any of these functions, which looks like quite a heavy restriction actually. Uh, there's a way to do it anyway, uh, which is uh, so it's there. So if you have um, a group of data and um, the types are different, the size may also be um, different and you want to group them together just to make a large message instead of uh, <coughs> issuing several uh, small messages, uh, you have <coughs> two solutions. Either you create what we call a derived type, so you're actually telling MPI, well, I want to create a new type, uh, which is something based on top of the uh, elementary uh, uh, types available from uh, from the C language. Uh, so this is one way to proceed. And the other one is to use uh, the uh, pack and pack mechanism, which is something 
like serialization actually. What you're doing is um, you're just taking your, um, your structure and um, you're writing all the information contained in your structure in, uh, in a binary buffer. So, uh, of course, you have to make a copy each time of your data before actually uh, being able to send them. And when you receive the data, you actually receive the binary uh, string containing the encoded information, so you have to reconstruct the data afterwards. Uh, I'll explain this a bit more in detail. And uh, when you want to implement some almost um, automatic way of uh, handling complex structures, uh, especially handling um, C++ classes, for instance, uh, this is more or less the only solution you have. And this is uh, the way that uh, Boost actually proceeds through its uh, MPI binding. When you use, um, MP when you use Boost MPI to uh, send data, uh, you need to implement the different classes you're about to uh, send. You need to implement serialization. Uh, so, uh, a few words on how to create a type. Well, the first question is how do you describe a C structure? Because creating a type is about uh, um, it, it, telling um, MPI how to natively handle uh, a C structure. So uh, you have to tell him the number of fields in the structure. You have to tell uh, MPI the types of each field in the structure, uh, the length of each field. So if all the fields are uh, uh, native types, it's fine. If you, have, uh, if you have pointers in it, uh, then it means that um, the number of elements in each field may depend on uh, the, uh, the, um, the involved elements. Uh, so the first three items are quite easy. And the last one becomes um, a, little more, a little trickier. Um, you have to tell MPI the... Um, the address of each element in the structure and the address is computed relatively to the address of the first element in the structure. What's your, what you're actually interested, what, what MPI is actually interested in, in with this last information is um, um, the um, 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 sorry. Yes, is how to move from one field to um, to the other. So, um, uh, and uh, and this information is um, is the one that makes it so complicated. Because imagine you have a structure with uh, pointers inside. When you actually um, allocate, well, you, you, you have to differentiate the structure itself with uh, an instance of the structure, okay? So each time you create a new variable with uh, the given type, uh, the spacing between the elements of the structure may change because when you allocate, uh, because what happens, well, probably I should just make a small picture. It will be uh, simple. If you have, so, so imagine you have, uh, well, this is your memory, okay? Divided in, uh, in blocks, like this. Uh, and then you have uh, some structure, uh, 
uh, and uh, and inside your structure you have uh, well let's say you have an integer that's this one is fine and there you have uh, you have a pointer let's say p p is the pointer you may have something else well no problem uh, well the problem is that uh, now you decide to create uh, a variable with this type. So you have a first instance of, uh, let's say that this is, uh, this, let's call this structure A, okay? Uh, so we, de we declare one variable, so uh, not very inspired here. <laughs> you do it this way, and so you declare one variable, and uh, obviously if you do this, you, you need to um, create the structure and then at some point you will need to do something like this. You will call uh, malloc with, uh, so you say it's uh, the size is size of double and the length of the, imagine the length is n, okay, everything is fine. And this gives you an address somewhere, up there. And your structure was uh, started, let's say, here. So the beginning of your structure is here. So you have A is here. Inside you have P and P points there. Up. So the space between the start of your, of your structure and, uh, and P is just this. And then you create another instance of, uh, of the same structure. Let's call it B. And you do the same. And what happens is that, um, well, your, uh, your B is here, and you have somewhere in B, you have B point P, and uh, well, the memory that was reserved for you this time is there. So it points there. Okay. And the problem is that here you have this for the difference of addresses, and here you have this. And these two are different. So it's very difficult to create derived types for structures containing uh, pointers. What you actually have to do is create a derived type per instance of the structure, which makes it more difficult. Okay. Uh, well. uh, Okay, uh, so this gives, this tells you how you actually create uh, a derived type. Uh, and this is an example of how to do it for, uh, well, this is actually a toy example. Your, truck, your um, structure is just uh, something like this. So you have uh, two integers, um, a real number, and afterwards, um, an array with size uh, 10, but this is a static one. Okay. If I had put here uh, a pointer to, uh, to shards instead of a static array, I should have uh, been in trouble because of this. Uh, okay, so this is an example. Uh, and there are variants of uh, various mechanisms to create derived types depending on whether your data are continuous or not, if they have all the same types or not. Uh, so uh, these are the different functions that you may, um, that you may use. Uh, okay. And the second mechanism I was mentioning to uh, handle uh, complex data through um, MPI communication functions uh, is uh, the packing mechanism. So um, uh, the idea is just to take all your data and uh, write them in, uh, in a binary format in a, in a buffer and then you send the buffer. So uh, the way to proceed is to call this function MPI pack um, for each element uh, in the structure. Okay, there's, there's an example in the coming slides. Uh, 
so uh, you put your the data to be um, to be written in the input buffer and uh, you write it in the output buffer uh, and the question is uh, to know how much memory you will need to write all your data because obviously you want your output buffer to be um, a continuous uh, a contiguous memory area okay. so you have to know in advance how much memory to allocate for this buffer and uh, the way to know this uh, is to call this function MPI pack size, which tells you, uh, well, if you want to store uh, an array of size uh, with size uh, 10 of real numbers, then you need um, uh, a binary uh, string with uh, this length. Okay, so this is the purpose of, uh, of this function. Uh, so what you do is for each um, field of your structure, you call this function MPI pack size. You just uh, uh, sum all the sizes you get with uh, with these calls, and it tells you, and gives you the total length uh, required by your binary buffer. And once you have it, then uh, you can start packing things. Uh, pay attention to this uh, variable, which gives, which uh, tells at which position in the uh, in the binary string you want to uh, actually write. And this this um, this argument is automatically incremented each time you um, you pack a new element. So at the beginning, the uh, the value is just zero. You start writing at the at the, at the beginning of the of the buffer, and then uh, you pack something. The size is automatic calculate is automatically calculated, and uh, it moves uh, well the writing head to somewhere uh, further in the in the string, to, just to make sure that everything is probably written in uh, in the end. So you do this, and then uh, on the receiving side, you just uh, unpack all the, uh, well, unpack the binary uh, buffer you've received and reconstruct different elements. Uh, so this is the, gener the, uh, the general principle of, um, of the packing mechanism. Um, in practice, uh, here is what you, the, uh, what, you, what you will do. So first you call uh, MPI pack size for each element then it allows you to know the total length required, the total uh, length uh, of your string, uh, of your binary buffer. Once you know the length, you can allocate it. <coughs> then you can actually pack the data in the buffer, send the message, and then you're on the receiver process, uh, and you're about to receive a message but you don't know its size. So you, have, you actually need first to um, ask MPI the, um, the size of the message you're supposed to receive because to actually receive the binary buffer, you, know, you need to know its size in advance just to allocate the required memory to store it locally. Uh, and this is the purpose of these two functions. So you call this one just to ask whether a message is available, and if so, with which, with what size. And if it's uh, so, if a message is available, it tells you yes or no, and it uh, returns a structure which um, you can investigate, and uh, in the investigation you can actually get the size. Once you have this, you can allocate a buffer locally on the receiving process, receive the data, and unpack them. Okay. So you actually have a copy um, before sending, but you also have a copy uh, in the end when you receive the data, because you, rec you first write the binary data you've received, and these uh, binary data uh, will be uh, extracted and, recre and you recreate um, the structure you, you, you expect. Though, so it's 
it's convenient because you don't have these problems with uh, uh, with padding in um, in structures, uh, but the price to pay is a copy each time. So it's fine. See if the amount of data you want to send is that is not too huge, but otherwise making copy each time is just well a waste of time. Okay. Uh, and I think uh, we're almost done. So uh, I don't. I won't say much about uh, communicators. Just um, uh, remember that there's one default communicator, and this is the one we're going to use. Otherwise, just uh, have a look at the manual, and there are uh, examples. Uh, so. Um, a few words of, uh, of conclusion, so um, MPI targets um, uh, distributed memory systems and uh, its only purpose is to uh, enable the programmer to easily exchange information between the different processes. This is the only thing um, it is actually designed for. Um, Make sure not to waste too much time in the communication, so uh, do not issue a communication if uh, uh, one of the process involved in it is not ready for actually communicating. And of course you can actually mix uh, OpenMP and MPI together if you have uh, a cluster architecture with uh, uh, many uh, cores inside each node. You can do it, but I'm not telling you that you will uh, really gain a lot of efficiency doing this uh, compared to just uh, using MPI on its own. MPI turns to be very, very efficient even when you use it on the shared memory systems. So, uh, of course, in some very, in some very specific applications, uh, you may be able to improve the performance of your application if you mix MPI and OpenMP, but uh, it's not easy to do it. Um, it may depend, uh, the way to do it may depend on uh, the architecture you're targeting because it depends on the number of cores you have per node. Uh, so you have to really uh, make sure there's still something to be gained before uh, trying to do so. Uh, okay, so that was the conclusion on, uh, on MPI and just before finishing I wanted to mention something else which, becoming, which is becoming more and more popular, uh, which is completely different from uh, MPI. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, of something called uh, MapReduce. This is, uh, well, this has become popular with uh, big data and all this is actually about uh, distributed file systems. The problem is, uh, imagine you have uh, so many data that they can't actually fill in memory and that they are spread in different computers, maybe in different locations and uh, there's no way you, you can move these data. They are where they are and what you have to move is actually the computations you're going to do. Um, and uh, there they, they, they are um, several tools to uh, do this. Two famous ones are uh, Hadoop and Spark uh, and uh, their goal is to make it easy for you to run computations on these um, spread data. So this is uh, uh, the map part of uh, the map reduce uh, approach. So you just uh, do computations where the data are and uh, afterwards you gather the results and this is the reduce uh, part. So, uh, of course, we could have probably uh, uh, spent the four hours talking about uh, MapReduce, but this, this, this wasn't the point um, here. I just wanted to mention it in the end, just to tell you, well, there are other things that can be done in high-performance computing, especially if 
uh, your problem actually uh, focuses on uh, big data rather than really uh, doing computations uh, on models as we usually do here. Okay, that's what's uh, all I wanted to tell you. Thank you.